My name is Charles Elson. I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and I'm appointed as a physician educator in the Division of Preventive Medicine at the University of Alberta. This session focuses on the occupational impact of one particular anxiety disorder occasionally encountered in practice, namely panic disorder. Thank you to the Workers' Compensation Board of Alberta for making funding available for this project. There are no conflicts of interest to declare and the opinions expressed in this presentation reflect those of the speaker and not necessarily that of any of the collaborators or the funding agency. This session provides a brief overview of the features of panic disorder, including causation, prevalence, diagnosis, treatment and prognosis. And it focuses on the occupational impact of panic disorder on the variables of capacity, risk and tolerance. At the end of the session, participants should be able to recognize panic disorder as an occupationally irrelevant medical condition, especially in safety sensitive settings, describe its impact on capacity, risk and tolerance, and thirdly, broadly outline evidence-based interventions to achieve maximum medical improvement. What is panic disorder? Well, it's a psychiatric condition that's characterized by recurrent, unexpected panic attacks. And a panic attack is an acute, intense attack of anxiety accompanied by feelings of impending doom. It's an abrupt surge of intense fear or intense discomfort that reaches a peak within minutes and during which several physical and cognitive symptoms occur. This sudden episode of intense fear that triggers severe physical reactions despite the absence of any real danger or apparent cause is highly distressing. Although the attack is not life-threatening, these attacks can seriously erode quality of life and the person suffering an attack feels like he or she is losing control, is having a heart attack or may even be dying. Persons having a recurrent unexpected attack that is without a cue or a trigger, may have long periods in constant fear of suffering another attack out of the blue, uh, in which case they are deemed to have a condition called panic disorder. The cause of panic disorder is considered to be uh, abnormal regulation of the noradrenergic systems in the brain, and other neurotransmitters have also been implicated. Like is the case with most psychiatric conditions, the biopsychosocial model applies and certainly genetics play a fundamental role in the cause of this mental condition. Substances like caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, stimulants like cocaine, amphetamines can trigger panic attacks. Other causes are of course genetic, stress-related and psychosocial in nature. The lifetime prevalence of panic disorder is about 1 to 4% and women are 2 to 3 times more likely to be affected. The condition usually develops in early adulthood. It's a clinical diagnosis with no single diagnostic test available. The diagnosis of panic disorder is made by taking a comprehensive history and performing a physical examination to rule out medical problems that may be causing or contributing. Uh, uh, to these symptoms. The physical examination is usually non-contributory in the context of diagnosing panic disorder, other than ruling out physical causes of anxiety symptoms. Blood tests are usually ordered to check, uh, for example, for thyroid and other conditions. Cardiac conditions need to be ruled out as well, uh, and therefore we may want to conduct an ECG. An evaluation that includes psychological testing may assist in the diagnosis, as do the use of focused rating scales, like the panic disorder severity rating scale. These scales help gauge the response to treatment as well. And finally, using the diagnostic criteria allows for a diagnosis to be made with a reasonable degree of certainty. The symptoms of panic disorder include the presence of recurrent unexpected panic attacks, and this is criterion A of the DSM, whereby a panic attack is an abrupt surge of intense fear or intense discomfort that reaches a peak within minutes, and during which four or more of a list of 13 physical and cognitive symptoms occur. These include 
palpitations, bounding heart or accelerated heart rate, sweating, trembling or shaking, sensations of shortness of breath or smothering, feelings of choking, chest pain or discomfort, nausea or abdominal distress, feeling dizzy, unsteady, lightheaded or faint, chills or heat sensations, paresthesias or numbness or tingling sensations, derealization or feelings of unreality or depersonalization that being feeling detached from oneself fear of losing control or going crazy fear of dying so the attack appears to occur out of the blue such as when the individual is relaxing or emerging from sleep and that's what we'd call a nocturnal panic attack in contrast to unexpected panic attacks attacks that are termed expected are those for which there's an obvious cue or trigger, such as a situation where panic attacks typically occur. The frequency of panic attacks can vary widely. After an attack, the worries persist about having another attack, and they may also be worry that panic attacks reflect the presence of life-threatening illnesses, for example, cardiac disease, seizure disorder, and others. Their social concerns, such as an embarrassment or fear of being judged negatively by others, uh, because others may witness the panic symptoms in the person having the attack. And they certainly concerned about mental functioning, such as going crazy, losing control, and these are captured in criterion B. The symptoms result in changes in behavior, and these are maladaptive changes and represents attempts to limit or avoid further attacks or the attack's consequences. The DSM lists examples as including the person avoiding physical exertion, reorganizing daily life to ensure that helps available in the event of such an attack, restricting usual daily activities, avoiding certain situations, for example, avoiding leaving home, avoiding public transportation, or even not going shopping anymore. It's noted that panic attacks can also occur in persons with MDD, generalized anxiety disorder, substance use disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and several other conditions. Risk capacity and tolerance are affected by this condition. So although capacity is not usually adversely impacted, uh, occupational risk is and the risk is usually foreseeably increased because of the distracting nature of the attack, especially when working in a safety sensitive position. When a person has been in the remission for six months or longer, the worker may usually be deemed fit for duty again. And it's not satisfactory to simply attempt to avoid triggers at work, uh, as some of these attacks may be completely unexpected and no cue or trigger may be identifiable. Occupational tolerance may be impacted negatively by the condition uh, and its features, but treatment usually tends to improve occupational tolerance. Panic disorder is considered highly treatable and treatment can help significantly so to reduce the frequency as well as the intensity of the symptoms of a panic attack and improve functioning and reduce subjective distress. Treatment consists of psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy, usually applied in conjunction with each other. And cognitive behavioral therapy is the treatment of choice. And there's a place for stress management, relaxation therapy, breathing exercises. Family therapy and group therapy may also be of benefit. Sleep hygiene and physical activities may be helpful in some. Several medications have been proven to be safe and efficacious in this regard, including the SSRIs and the SNRIs. Other classes of drugs like the MAOIs and the tricyclics have also been used with success. Although the benzodiazepines may provide symptomatic relief, these medications may pose a concern with regards to sedation and hence an increased occupational uh, uh, risk as a result. Benzodiazepine medications may also not be a good choice if the individual has a history of drug or alcohol problems in the past. Avoiding caffeine, alcohol, smoking and the recreational drugs can also limit, limit panic attacks. Maximum medical improvement is usually reached within months. The prognosis is usually good. It's a highly treatable condition uh, and those who do not achieve full remission 
usually have symptoms that are not of sufficient intensity to adversely impact occupational functioning. We do, however, require full remission for return to safety-sensitive workplaces. Screening should be conducted uh, for complications like MDD and substance use problems, and those individuals with good pre-morbid functioning and symptoms of brief duration tend to have the best prognosis. Panic disorder is relatively common, can be incapacitating, may increase occupational risk, usually does not adversely impact occupational capacity. Panic disorder is treatable and after six months of remission, persons can usually return to safety sensitive positions. We've included a list of resources which may be helpful. Thank you for your attention. We look forward to your feedback and comments and please help us identify further topics for future discussion. Thank you.